We thank you for this community and this school system. We ask that you'll direct us in all we do, and we'll do it in a way that honors you. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I ask if you would stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Be led. Here we go. Please pardon. Okay. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which is made one nation under God and in the of liberty and justice for all. Thank you. May be seated. All right, we'll call the meeting officially to order. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. The approval of the board minutes. You have that in front of you, board members. Is our motion to approve the agenda as you see it tonight? Make a motion. Motion by Mr. Wagner. Is there a second? Second. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Second. Thank you. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Hearing none approved, the motion is carried. We need uh, approval of the open session minutes for January 22nd, the special call meeting we had. There's a motion to approve that. I'll make that motion. Motion by Dr. Blevins. Is there a second? Second. Second by Jennifer. All in favor say aye. 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 Hearing none opposed, the motion carries. Thank you very much. All right. Good news. I love good news. Ms. Rycroft. Or Dr. Hall, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> Miss Burton, whoever. Everybody all want to be part of good news. Exactly. Absolutely. I am here for the elementary school to begin with. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Hall, and community, parents, members, staff. I am excited to introduce you to our Elkin Elementary <laughs> beta team. Elementary school beta team is made up of Amber Tilly and Taylor Tilden, who are the sponsors. Um, Jeremy Huff is with Robotics. Denise Cordova, Engineering. Christy Simmons is Trading Pen and Apparel Design. Um, Evelise Minoso is Sasha Murphy and Ben Gentry do 3D design and technology. Jessica Schaller and Shauna Poindexter do book battle. And Jessica Schaller also does service learning. So the sponsor will take over and I just want to lead you and guide you through everything. So thank you for having us here today. Um, so we're just going to go through our state convention winners. And so we'll begin with our um, junior beta, which is our sixth grade members. So our first place in fiber arts was Kylie Chilton. She is not here tonight, but she got first place. And then our engineering team, um, our junior engineering team, they got second place. So that's Lena Simmons and Paulette Flores, Jesse Ravis, Adam A, and their coach is Christy Simmons. And then our um, Daniel Mathis, he plays in the yeah. academic category in social studies, and he plays third. And then Paulette Flores, she um, plays fourth in Spanish. And then our club trading pin, this is coached by Evelise Minoso. And the members are Stella Pilkinson, Gia Minoso, and Blakely Eller, and they place fourth. And then Malia Orta, she plays fifth in Digitally Enhanced Art. Addie White plays fifth in Scrapbooking. 
And then our service learning showcase was Audrey Engler and Kylie Chilton, and they placed fifth. <clears throat> now we'll begin with our elementary students. So this is our fourth and fifth grade students. Um, Zoe Murphy, she placed first in creative writing. And then our marketing communications team, um, I coached that one. And that's Lila Burgess, Camden Tilly, Christian Minoso, Zoe Murphy, and Will Durkin. And then our 3D design, that's coached by Sasha Murphy, Alex Nicholson, Zoe Murphy, and Will Durkin. And then Ellie Miller plays second in sculpture. Sarah Santiago, she plays second in hand-drawn anime. Madison Gentry plays second in color photography. Christian Minoso plays second in on-site drawing. Crosby Watson plays third in social studies. Asley Kohler plays third in speech. And then this is our book battle team, and it's coached by Shauna Poindexter. And that's Harper Richardson, Sarah Santiago, Braden Freeze, and they place third. And then our apparel design, coached by Miss Minoso, and that's Tinley Hayes and Allie Bobbitt, and they place fourth. And then Addison Wyatt placed fourth in poetry. And then Mariella Zunga, she placed fourth in Spanish. Norella Simmons placed fifth in drawing. And then our club trading pin, um, they got fifth place. That was Cannon Swisher, Bristol Mitchum, Janie and Hebe, Christian Minoso, and that is also coached by Miss Minoso. And then our engineering team, and that's coached by Miss Cordova, and that's Lizzie Charles, St James St. Cyr, Tim Gard, and Gia Valet Valdez, and they placed fifth. And that is all for our elementary. <laughs> this one of your kids please stand the kids can't do it without the parents i want to thank the parents i want to thank thank you so much for allowing your child to be part of this that's a great thing thank you that's real good very good now the middle school My babies. that's right I'm excited and privileged to introduce you to our Elkin Middle School beta team. Ms. Spencer and Ms. Swisher have worked tire tirelessly to support our 42 members. Students and teachers collaborate and work independently throughout the school year. Beta provides our students opportunities to enrich and differentiate their learning while focusing on the four pillars, academic achievement, character, leadership, and service. Tonight, we recognize their hard work of our beta members and our teachers and say a huge thank you to them for all of their achievements. Their parents, can you have their, go ahead. Yeah, we have their results. Yeah, go ahead. From the state competition. Yeah, thank you. Ruby Gwynn Sally, Elkin Middle School Beta, fifth place poetry. Wyatt Gaddis, Elkin Middle School Beta, third place science academic test. Shayla Ainge, Elkin Middle School Beta, fourth place mixed media. Emily Lede, Elkin Middle School Beta, fifth place painting. Briley Ainge, Elkin Middle School Beta, third place, three-dimensional design. Jackson Andrews, Zoe Davis, Anna Kate Slaughter, and Mia Swain, the middle school, third place, marketing and communications. Shyla Ainge, Lucy Henstock, Katie Lyles, the middle school, fourth place, book battle team. These guys, these ladies, Elena Brown, Keelan Cook, Kenley Cook, Layla Kate Edwards, Sadie Keller, Zoe Stilley. That was our first place champion. They placed uh, first in the living literature. 
And so while we tried to demonstrate some of those art artifacts tonight for you guys so that you could see them in person, um, we hope that you guys enjoyed that and we hope to continue to promote that in the future for the community. It just the pictures don't do it justice. And with Living Lit, there's no way that they could have recreated that mm -hmm. tonight. But they look forward to doing that in Savannah, Georgia. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. and I forgot, I forgot one. Layla K. Edwards, Elkin Middle School, first place champion in speech. Oh. have their parents if they got parents or relatives here can they stand we want to recognize the supporters the parents thank you thank you very much good afternoon i am going to call on our high school co-sponsors mrs julie reed and mrs carrie mullis to recognize our high school beta um, I feel like I say this often when I recognize high school students. There aren't very many here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's a good problem because our kids are involved in so many things. So um, many of them are at different practices tonight. Um, but still, we do want to take the time to recognize them. I do want to try something a little bit different, if I may. So if we do have high school kids who are here, if you will come forward, I'm going to put you in a different place. Maybe you can stand like this, then the board can see you and the audience. Awesome. Good. Good evening, board, Dr. Hall, parents. Um, we are very proud of our kids. We took 53 high school students to beta, so we are super, super thrilled. They're very well-rounded kids, as Ms. Burton said. There's shooting team tests tonight. There's a baseball game, spring sports, and several are working jobs. So they do a lot and are still participating in beta. So we appreciate their hard work. But Ms. Mullis is gonna recognize our winners. So Reese Long got second place in ninth grade language arts. Autumn Longworth got third place in poetry division one. So division one is ninth and 10th grade and then division two is 11th and 12th. Molly Adams got second place in ninth grade science. Valeria Guzman got fifth place in 12th grade Spanish. Anaya Edwards, Jericho Edwards, and Marley Wolf were a team to do book battle, and they got fifth place. Isabella Estrada actually won two awards. She got first place for her ship that she built for Mixed Media Division II, and she also received third place for 11th grade Spanish. Autumn Whitley got fifth place with her woodworking in Division I. Evan Baker got second place with color photo photography for Division I. Maggie Sebastian got fifth place for Fiber Arts Division II. Sophie Welburn got fourth place in black and white photography for Division II. Ranger Tichi, who's here this evening, got fifth place for Digital Art Division II. Caroline Sowers, who is here tonight, got third place for on-site drawing division two. So she actually created her masterpiece in two hours on site there, and she did a great job. Amanda Schaffner got first place with her sculpture in division two. And her brother, Carson Schaffner, got second place for sculpture in division one. Maggie Hall got fourth place in speech for division two. And then we have team competition. So Brady Reed, Mallory Wall, and Alyssa Freeman, and Matthew Thomas, they made our musicology team, and they actually got first place. They were champions. They worked really hard, but it wasn't even a close call for them against the other teams. They kind of blew it out of the water a little bit. <laughs> Bo Huff, Jaden Martin, Valeria Guzman, and Alyssa Freeman were our robotics team, and they did a great job at the convention. Uh, when their competition was getting ready to start, it was actually like an hour and a half late before they could even start and get set up. So they were very tired by the end of the day because it took a while, but they ended up getting second place with their robotics. And our last group is our digital portfolio. So this group of students made this portfolio before they went and they had a great display piece. You might not be able to see it in the picture, but there's actually like an iPad in there that was scrolling digitally about all the members in our club. So they spent a lot of time to make this work and then put, set this up. Um, so those students were Alyssa Freeman, Evan Baker, Marley Cockrum, 
Autumn Longworth, Emma Hawkins, Mackenzie White, Mason Day, Aiden Bird, and Estefany Morales. So that's our club. Do we have any parents that want to stand up? Thanks, you guys. I think, I think this is very important. Beyond the awards and the kids that participated, our students received compliments on their behavior. We're at a convention center with people all across the state of North Carolina, and Elkin High School consistently is recognized for their behavior, and that speaks well of parents, of our leaders in the school, and the expectations set here. Not one issue, and they brag on our kids, so I think that's super. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, thank you for re reminding us of that because I, I have seen that over the years as well. And, you know, we shouldn't take that for granted because when you go to these places, you'll see behavior that's not Elkin behavior. So thank you, Miss Reed, for bringing that to our attention. And we should always be grateful. I, and I am grateful for the parents and the leaders. All right. Next on the agenda, Dr. Hall. Sir, another bit of good news. Uh, we recently found out that we won a North Carolina school safety grant from uh, North Carolina DVI. Uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Ms. McManus, and Mr. Altmuller and Mr. Shaw for writing that grant, putting it together. Um, this, it was awarded to us uh, in January, end of January, uh, we received $300,000. And that will be used to upgrade our current uh, keyless entry system, camera system. And also it will add that same system, or it's newer, of course, uh, to our new gym that will be opening soon. We'll have all new cameras, keyless entry, and all the system throughout our school system will be upgraded as well. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. So thank you to those folks for putting that grant together and working to keep our kids safe in all of our campuses. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next on the agenda, we have the public forum. And uh, looks like uh, Mr. Ralph Bashir's signed up to speak. There you go. Mr. Chairman, board members, Mr. Superintendent, um, once again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you as an advocate for the Global Learning Academy. I believe that our school board should be the strongest and most positive supporters of our schools, students, and parents. The Elkin City Schools District is a special entity and an integral part of our community. It offers its citizens a special opportunity to have a voice in the education of their children, even to the point of their paying a school tax for its support. The district's contributions to the community should be highlighted and publicly noted. School board, has as its own special opportunity to be a part of that process. It was a special experience for me to have attended the last two school board meetings. It was inspiring and heartwarming to hear parents and students from the Global Academy giving their testimonies of how this special program has served them in their special situations. It has helped me define who my neighbors are and some of the differing circumstances we can serve them. Has not this program expanded a much desired loyalty to and support of our schools? I truly believe that the Global Academy program is an asset to our system and community. Also, I truly believe that should you decide to continue this program, your action would, act, would be appreciated 
by a broad number of persons affected by it. Such action would set us apart and positively highlight some of the good things that are taking place in our schools. Is not such a result appropriate and worthy of consideration? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bashirs, as always. Thank you. For anybody online? Uh, Jerry Laws. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Laws. Okay. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and the board for allowing me to speak this evening. I'll try to keep this brief. I just wanted to say a couple of comments about the proposed uh, school calendars. Um, I believe it was House Bill 86 that was passed March 7th of 2023. Uh, it was passed with a vote of a 111 to 2 that would grant calendar flexibility to all schools in the state of North Carolina. On March the 8th, that bill was referred to the committee and the Senate and has never been taken out of committee. I believe this is based upon the leadership of Mr. Phil Berger in the state Senate. I just wanna say that, you know, the Elkin City School Board is not elected to serve Mr. Phil Berger. It is elected to serve the students and the educators of our school system. And I think that regardless of what the calendar law is, the only acceptable answer to, proper, to properly serve our students is the early start calendar. That's all I wanted to say. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Laws. Thank you. All right. So now we come, that's all I have for the public forum. Anyone else? Britt? Online. Yeah, there's nothing, there's no one else on the sign up sheet. So seeing none, hearing none, we'll, uh, we'll close the public forum. Uh, board, now we, uh, we come to the moment for a recess if that be appropriate. Okay, so we'll take a two minute recess. Three minutes, sir. Three minutes. Three minutes. All right, we'll come back into session. And we have some public information items. We we'll start with Ms. Purdue. Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Hall, Mr. Ch Chairman, members of the board. I'm here tonight to share with you all updates to our dual language immersion program now in its fourth year of implementation. I'd like to begin with what guides dual language immersion decision making within the district, keeping us focused on academic excellence and program implementation efforts. As a member of the district leadership team, these six priorities here on the left-hand side provide structure for making the best possible academic decisions 
to our dual language immersion program. The purpose, vision, and mission listed here on the right-hand side was developed upon initial implementation of our dual language immersion program and speaks to our commitment to providing students with the opportunity to become both bilingual and biliterate, promote high academic achievement, and learn and respect other cultures while embracing their own. Here, I have tried, sorry, here on this slide, I have tried to document all of the notable DLI program up updates to date for the 23-24 school year. I must say that in our fourth year of implementation, I am proud of our growth as a program. Everything underlined is hyperlinked, and I have provided you with some hard copies in the folder that I've provided. I would like to make note of a few highlights. You'll see that there's been a concerted effort to place high quality instructional materials in our DLI teachers' hands. All DLI teachers, K-3, this school year are teaching a Spanish literacy block with a high quality Spanish language arts curriculum. I'd also like to highlight our Lectura data. Lectura is our Spanish literacy universal screener. It's an assessment that measures risk rather than proficiency. It's administered three times a year. We are always striving for our students to score at minimal risk. At the beginning of the year, 59% of our K-3 students were at minimal risk. At middle of the year, 77% of our K-3 students were at minimal risk, showing an 18% growth from September to January in foundational Spanish literacy skills. You have a full breakdown of both Spanish and English data in your folder, but please note that English data is limited to second and third grade only. The state does not require us to assess in English in kindergarten, first grade, since we are full immersion in those two grade levels. We also sent out a, do, a DLI parent survey back in the fall to gather feedback from our families on the effectiveness of our implementation efforts. There's a blank copy of the survey that was sent out in your folder for your review. We have used the feedback gathered from the survey results to assist us in making program changes to strengthen our implementation efforts. This has included sharing DLI advisory committee dates for the 23 school year and opening up all of those meetings for any DLI parent or stakeholder. Agendas and meeting notes are shared out via email to all uh, stakeholders in attendance. I have provided you February's agenda and meeting notes in your folder for review so that you can take a look at those. Uh, immediately following the parent survey, the advisory committee got to work with a needs assessment of our DLI program. We basically examined the health of our program and asked ourselves the question, what's working well and what do we need to improve upon? That led to the 23-24 DLI timeline for revision. I've also included that document in your folder for you to review. This is a working document that not only holds me accountable as a leader, that keeps our advisory committee moving forward in our implementation efforts. Two big wins for our program recently in the month of February was the completion of our DLI webpage on the Elkin City Schools website that went live on February 7th and the kindergarten class cap of 18 for our incoming 24-25 DLI cohort, which will mirror that of our traditional kindergarten classrooms. This decision was made in direct response to the feedback that we received from the parent surveys that we sent out in the fall. We wanted parents to know that we were listening and valued their input with the decision to decrease the cap. So as you can see from everything that I listed on this slide here, um, or I hope that you can see so far uh, from July 1 to February 26th, it's definitely been a year of movement and growth for our DLI program. Um, March 18th, we are very excited that we are going to visit uh, Jones Elementary in Guilford County, which is the longest running DLI program in our state. So all of our DLI teachers, as well as our building level administrators, myself, Dr. Altmuller, we will travel to Jones Elementary and we will get to visit and see that school in action. Now it is a different program model than what we are running, because we have one class per grade level, whereas this is a whole dual language immersion school 
but we will still get to speak with teachers and leaders that have been doing this a lot longer than we have. So we're excited to learn from them. As I reflect on the 23-24 school year so far in regards to our DLI program, there are two hallmarks of success that I'd like to leave you with tonight. Number one, I'm a firm believer that messaging matters. July 1, I made it my personal mission to set out to provide opportunities for others to learn about dual language immersion. I've had the opportunity to do just that with our generous partners at the Elkin Enrichment Foundation, those of you here on the board, other teachers, district leaders, those that attend our DOI advisory committee meetings, even people that I run into at the grocery store who say, hey, tell me a little bit about that DLI program and what that really means. Um, my parents, my family members, pretty much anybody who doesn't know anything about DLI, they, they ask me what it means. So I've had the opportunity to school some people on what DLI really is. And here's where that makes a difference, in my opinion. Every stakeholder receives the same information. The who, the what, the how, the why of DLI fosters program transparency, and that is very important. The second hallmark of success for 23-24, when you plan on purpose, growth happens. For those of you who know me, you know that strategic planning is my strength. It's just how I do business. So when faced with new challenge of a new program area, July 1, that was still very much in the infancy stages of implementation, the only way that I knew how to approach continued implementation was through strategic planning efforts. 2324 has been about embracing not yet and developing a plan for how we get there. So thank you so much. How many students do we have enrolled in this? Currently 87 K3. It's just K through three. Currently. We will add a new kindergarten cohort for 24-25. And we will be K4. Two Ks, two cohorts, is that what you're saying? No, we add a new kindergarten cohort. Oh, okay. Year. Yep, that's how we build the program is by right, adding right, a new kindergarten right, right, class. Right. Not, yep. not two kindergarten no, groups. Okay. No, just one each okay. year. Okay. Yep. Did you say 83 or 87 currently? Oh. <laughs> if you add the three and four together, you get that. Oh, <laughs> right. uh, Sorry. Our, our legal counsel. Now, are the students who come in, are they all, is their primary language English? Or is there maybe primary language Spanish and still getting the dual immersion? Or how does that work? That's a good question. So we are a two-way immersion program, which means that we serve both native English speakers and native Spanish speakers. So we are technically supposed to be about a 50-50 split. So half of our incoming kindergarten class should be native English speakers and half of our incoming kindergarten class should be native Spanish speakers. Now, in our current K-3 classrooms, we have about 30% of, of each cohort that's basically native Spanish speakers. So as an advisory committee, we know that that's an area of growth for us. That's going to be challenging for this incoming kindergarten cohort because at a cap size of 18 and with the fact that Parent families that already have children that are seated in the program, they automatically have a seat at the table, basically, in this new kindergarten cohort. That doesn't leave a lot of room for native English speakers for the lottery. Um, and we are struggling a little bit with communicating with our native Spanish speakers on the benefits of enrolling their children in the program. So we were super excited at our February advisory committee meeting. We had three Spanish speaking uh, parents that showed up and that was the first time that that had happened. Um, so we, we felt very excited and very hopeful. So there's a lot of research out there about Span native Spanish speakers and this being a, a big asset to them because it actually doesn't 
create such a achievement gap because they're able to use their language as an asset and bring that into that kindergarten classroom. So we really want to build that part of the program. Thank you me. are still using a lottery. Like, is that how? Yes, April April 11th is our lottery date. And we will, we are videoing that. And that will be placed on our website, again, for transparency purposes. How many uh, positions can win? How many winners can there be? Well, we we have we will have a cohort of eighteen that we that's the that's the cap size for our incoming kindergarten cohort. It will depend on how many uh, families of children that are currently seated in current kindergarten through third grade classrooms want to re-enroll, right? So if they if a family has a child that's already in our DLI program and they have an incoming kindergarten student, they automatically get a spot. So if we have five families that are returning, then they already get a spot, then we would have a lottery for 13 children, right? Yeah. One more question? Yeah. Um, for the reading risk, is that reading in Spanish or English? It is in, it's all Spanish literacy skills. So in kindergarten and first grade, we are a full immersion model. Mm -hmm. So our children are learning to read in Spanish. So in both the Spanish language and the English language, there are five vowels. But in the Spanish language, those five vowels have five sounds. In the English language, those five vowels have 12 sounds. Mm -hmm. So our children are learning to read in Spanish. In kindergarten and first grade, the state only requires us to assess in Spanish. By the time they reach second grade, we are at a 70-30 language allocation model where 70% of the day is delivered in the Spanish language and 30% of the day is delivered in the English language. When you get to that 30% English mm -hmm. allocation, the state requires us to assess in English. We do not stop assessing in Spanish because we find that it's very important to keep a close tabs on those Spanish literacy skills as well. So we have made a plan for how to keep going with that because there's a report where we can compare uh, the skills in both the English and the Spanish language. So um, we keep going in both languages. I was just curious, I guess, not concerned, well, curious if that will affect them in the third grade, knowing that they've probably acquired the knowledge that they need, but will they, they have difficulty taking the end of year, beginning of year test? Like, will will be, that affect them in any way? This, even though they may know what, you know what I mean? It just, they may not know English well enough since it's only given in English, right? Yes. So this will be our first year that we collect data on end of grade tests because this is the first group of students that has gotten to that point. I can tell you that when this cohort of students participated in the beginning of grade assessment that all of our third grade students participate in, there was not a huge discrepancy in the data that was collected from our traditional third grade classrooms and our dual language immersion classroom. Just know how much anxiety so many of these kids already have just with that testing. So I was just hoping that that would be the case. Yeah. For that. Any other questions? Mr. So Lyra? at what juncture does it go from 70-30 to 50-50? Um, we, we switch to a 50-50 model in third grade and we maintain a 50-50 language allocation third, fourth, and fifth grade. Anyone else? I want you to, uh, Ms. Purdue, I know when we initially started this program, we had uh, explained the process of hiring teachers and how difficult that was for us uh, to the newer board members, you know, to appreciate how that how that works. Uh, you know, if you would explain that a little bit, how, I mean, it's been a challenge. So we, we do partner with an outside agency and that outside agency basically kind of does the legwork for us. So they, they go fishing 
for the international applicants for us uh, so that we don't have to do that legwork. Um, so they, they gather the applicants and we interview those applicants. They take care of all of the visa requirements for those applicants. They also take care of health insurance and things of that nature for the applicant so that those are not expenses that we're having to take care of locally for those applicants. So we are paying them strictly a salary. We don't have to worry about paying them benefits. Um, we can get into more of those conversations, I feel like, in a more private setting since we would be talking more personnel matters. Um, but basically when we contract for their services, they're taking care of those pieces so that they're attracting an applicant pool that we would not have access to because it would be, or it is very challenging for us to find applicants who are native Spanish speakers. As we move up in grade level, it's not as necessary to have a candidate, a classroom teacher that is a native Spanish speaker in the classroom. Um, but culturally speaking, um, I know our parents are very pleased. Um, and that is one thing that is very attractive about the teachers that we have placed in the program. They, they like having uh, international teachers and what the teachers bring into the classroom from the different countries because we have two teachers from Colombia, a teacher from um, Honduras. Um, we have a teacher from Puerto Rico. So they, they like all of the different cultural elements that the teachers are able to bring into the classroom. And we do interview um, on March 19th. So we don't know where our new teacher will be. From. Thank you. I, I just uh, want to make him aware of, of the process. Yes. And I'll, I'll be happy to share with you some more specifics. Um, I just, I don't know exactly what I'm allowed to share. Um, and I don't, I don't want to get in trouble with that. No, no. <laughs> No, no, we don't want to do that. Thank you very much. Any, yes, anyone are. else? All right. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Next on the agenda, House. Good Ooh, evening. Calendar. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Hall, and Ms. Tomberlin, and guests. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here this evening to present these calendars to you. Um, Britt, if you will pull up the early start calendar, I'll be going over some other items prior to that. Um, I am going to be presenting two draft 24-25 school calendars to you this evening, um, and I'm going to provide you some feedback of the calendar survey that was posted on January 31st, and it came down on February the 23rd, which was this past Friday. Before we look at this calendar, I want to remind you of school calendar requirements as set at this time. Uh, the start date, no earlier than Monday closest to August 26th, and the end date, no later than the Friday closest to June the 11th. Um, at this time, there are no educational purpose waivers. All schools within the district must be closed all day for purposes of determining eligibility for a weather-related waiver. Um, a school calendar must cover at least nine calendar months, must have a minimum of 185 days or 1,025 hours of instruction. Elkin City Schools has traditionally followed the hours requirement. Must have at least nine teacher work days. Of those work days, two of those must be optional work days so that teachers can take accumulated leave. Have a minimum of 10 annual vacation leave days. 
have the same or equivalent number of legal holidays occurring within the school calendar as those designated by the State Personnel Commission for State Employees. School shall not be held on Sunday. And Veterans Day, which is always November the 11th, there shall be, this shall be a holiday for all public school personnel and for all students enrolled in public schools. So those are the current requirements. Also, teachers are required to work 215 days during a school year. So the first calendar pulled up is a early start calendar. This would be for 10 month employees and they would return on August the 7th. Students would return August 14th. Exams would be given prior to the Christmas break. The first semester would end on December 20th. The second semester would begin on January the 7th. Last student day would be May 29th. And the last day for 10 month employees would be June the 3rd. Any questions regarding the early start calendar? Any questions? Okay, uh, Britt, if you will pull up the traditional start calendar. Okay, now you're viewing the traditional start calendar and 10 month employees would return on August the 19th Students would return August 26th. Exams would not be given prior to the Christmas break. First semester would end on January 16th. Second semester would begin January 21st. Last student day would be June 11th. Last day for 10-month employees would be June 13th. Any questions regarding this calendar? Any questions for Ms. Allison? Hearing none, you're doing great. Okay, so the uh, survey was posted, uh, as I stated earlier. There were 148 responses to the school calendar survey. The majority of the comments requested for the early start calendar to be approved. Some of the supporting comments for the early start calendar were, this calendar aligns more closely with high school sports and the Surrey Community College calendar. High school exams would be prior to Christmas and some like getting out in May versus mid June. And then some of the supporting comments for the traditional start calendar were late start provides more summer weather for kids. Additional, add additional time to the school day to prevent going into June if you chose the traditional calendar. Now, the only problem with that is teachers still have to work 215 days. Teachers are not by hours. Which is Correct. They are by days. And the other one, in order to follow the school calendar law set forth by the state of North Carolina, the traditional start calendar should be approved. Do you have any questions about any of this information at this time? Do you know what the percentage was? I'm sorry? Do you know what the percentage was? Like 90 yes, 10 no, or I mean, do you have a percentage? A little bit more specific than majority. Um, the majority could be like 51. I, I can go back and figure out the percentages. But just looking at the comments, at least 75%, maybe 90, but between 75 and 90% for the early start. But you can let us know. I absolutely can. Thank you. Any other questions? She's going to let us know. Any questions? Nope. Really? All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Board members, the next thing on the agenda is the action items. 
We start there, as you see on your agenda, Dr. Steve Hall. Second reading of revised policies. Sir, thank you. Uh, the first, <clears throat> second reading there is policy 7130 on licensure that we spoke of at our last regular board meeting. Uh, this came down as a with some changes uh, from uh, DPI along with State Board of Education. Um, and we discussed this the last time. It was just some minor tweaks. Uh, they took out the digital teaching and learning. They moved those credits around and you can get more general credits now. Uh, and we also spoke to, it's constantly changing back and forth in another year or two, we may see that pop back up, but currently their CEUs are still eight, but they just shifted those credits. Uh, so that was the only change there. Is there a motion to approve this policy as amended? I'll make that motion. Motion by Jennifer. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Wagner. Any discussion about this policy? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, the second uh, policy there we had up for second reading was policy 2610, which uh, affects or is about the board attorney uh, relationship. And um, it was brought up to as a suggestion from some board members to make some adjustments to that. And the change you see uh, in the link here uh, would be basically an any individual board member could contact the school board attorney. That was the proposed change in there. Originally, uh, the policy states that uh, any Thing would go through the board chair and then the board chair would contact the board attorney. That was the original, or that's the policy as it is today. Uh, the proposed change was uh, any individual board member could contact Miss Alley uh, with a question or a concern. All right. Is there a motion to approve this amended policy? I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Here, no second. Policy stays as is. Motion falls to the ground. Thank you for the proper wording. All right. Next item on the agenda Dr. Steve Hall. Yes, sir. Globally Learning Academy. Yes, sir. Uh, as you know, the last several, well, over the past month, basically, a little over, uh, we've been discussing uh, Global Learning Academy. Uh, first, want to thank uh, all the parents, students, community members, staff members uh, associated with GLA for coming to those meetings and speaking out. <clears throat> And for the calls, the emails, the texts, and so on, uh, those heartfelt words were were heard by myself and the board. Uh, I'm speaking for them, but I believe those words were heard. Um, and we all know that. <clears throat> they'll all probably be going off. Um, we all know GLA came to fruition uh, due to the pandemic. That's where it originated. Um, in the past several weeks, you've heard us talk about the academics, the attendance, the financial side of it. And we, we know there's a lot of avenues there, a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of things involved. Um, Mr. Chairman and board, You've heard the numbers. You've heard the feedback. Uh, now I will await the board's decision on the direction they would like me to take. So, Mr. Chairman, I will turn it back over to you and the board for the motion. All right, board. Is there a motion on the table? Mr. Blackman. 
I was going to ask some questions before the motion, but I can make a motion. I'll, do, I'll defer to whatever you. I thought we would have a have a motion first, and then we'll have some discussion. Give us a little bit of direction. Mr. Chairman, I move that we discontinue the Global Learning Academy, effective June 30th, 2023. Discussion? Need to be a second? Is there a second on that before we have discussion? Is there a second to discontinue? Yes. We'll need a second to discontinue. And then we'll make up, then we will have discussion. Well, I guess I will second, but I would like to know numbers further. All right. So there's a, there's a second and that allows for we'll allow for discussion. Okay. We'd like to start. Um, Dr. Hall, would you refresh our help us to have clarification regarding the grade that the DPI and the North Carolina Board of Education have get, has given to the Global Learning Academy for the since its inception the past three years? Uh, yes, sir. The, the first year was during the COVID period, so there was well, the first the first two, there were no letter grades given, but the past two years, um, 21, 22, 22, 23, were both uh, a letter grade of D for the, for the global academy. Okay. More questions? Uh, yes, how much how much will this cost us or how much will we lose if we continue it per year? That, again, that number has been, is fluctuated depending on different ways we look at it. Uh, but um, as I've met with Rachel, our CFO, and, and discussed it, it fluctuated from anywhere from around 150000 up to 175000 dollars or or more depending uh, you know and there's factors in there uh, that we can't control um, with the numbers of students fluctuating within that program itself uh, it's down to 57 you know that we discussed uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, 40 of those are, are out of district students 19 are in uh, or 50, 16 somewhere in that neighborhood um, or out or in district students. Uh, so with that fluctuation, there's you can't give a definitive, but you can kind of see the range there of, of what we would lose. So do I understand you correctly? You're saying that we would lose a hundred and seventy some thousand dollars per year? It's a possibility, yes. Just, Questions? I just want to make sure like one of my questions was there was no way I, I want to make sure that this is accurate that we could somehow absorb the GLA into the main school like not called GLA but still retain and do the same things but under the umbrella of the school but not having it be a GLA do you know what uh, all right time to talk to with Cynthia some about that and run in like close it but virtual, yeah you know, program mm -hmm. It's just uh, not possible. We we met with a lady from DPI uh, last week, uh, Miss Miss Altmuller and uh, Miss Purdue and myself uh, to discuss because we were looking at every option and every avenue. Yeah, I like just want to make sure. Yeah, and, um, there's a lot of things involved with that. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, we asked the question about the co-teaching model and dropping that price, but there's a lot more factors involved to get that price. You're not guaranteed to get the from 349 down to 109. She went through those scenarios with us. There's more hoops to jump through. 
I guess you could say. Um, and then it's not a guarantee. Uh, again, it's based on students. It's based on teaching certifications. Um, so, and, and the majority of those students currently in the program are on the virtual side in the NCDPS classes with the 912 students. Um, so th there's a lot of factors at play there. Um, you want to add anything, Dr. Alton? So what's the student teacher ratio between the seventh uh, with the seventh and eighth graders if this or projected if we continue next year? What would it be? What is it now and what would it be? What's the projection from today, Dr. Alton? You said we currently have 58, 57? Well, since we currently have nothing feeding our middle school other than the kids we have in it, the numbers will be low because we're not necessarily promoting GLA because I don't want to tell someone that we'll have a school for the next year because we might not. So uh, it would be considerably low, especially for sixth grade because we don't have anything feeding in sixth grade. Right. Do we, do we have approximate numbers? I mean, in the so currently we have currently um, we have 12, 6, 7, 8, 8. Um, that's actually so next year. The, 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 you know, how many of those are eighth graders? How many? Currently, we have 30 kids that are six, seven, eight, three. That's what I heard you say. Yes, sir. That was some quick mental math. So, uh, what was the other part of your question there, Mr. Bagley? Well, what was the ratio of uh, student teachers, teacher students? We have in middle school? Yes. Well, we have four teachers. Um, I think mean, I have a point something. Any other questions? Do, do we know how many of those 30, like do we know how many are eighth graders would be going into the high school? 15, 16. So there'd be no feeder program. So we could look to possibly 14. In the middle school next year, if no more, I mean, if no more added, I'm just saying, of the ones that are currently in there. I have to be four teachers. I have one question. <clears throat> well, again, I, my concern would be what would that we're losing students, possibility of losing students. And that concerns me a great deal, whether they're in the district or out of district. And that concerns me a lot uh, because you're going to use, lose the ADM, those students. That's my concern. Uh, so. Any other questions? Do, do I understand correctly that we have exhausted avenues of ways to try to move money around or do something to make this more cost effective. Is that my understanding? 
we've dug into it constantly since the first meeting we had. I've had Rachel and Jan both running the numbers and looking at the numbers at all angles. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Any other questions? All for the question, Mr. Chairman. All in favor of closing the Global Academy, say aye. Aye. Aye, aye as well. All opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Hall, field overnight field trip. Yes, sir. We have uh, presented before you um, the EHS uh, teacher cadet class, uh, Future Teachers of America Convention uh, is held in Raleigh each year. And uh, they, uh, Ms. Tomlin is looking to take that class down for this event. It, it's a great time for them to ask future teachers to go and hear and see from other teachers current uh, they'll also get to hear some speakers and things. Uh, it's a great event. It's great exposure for them um, and to get build some excitement as a future teacher. Um, so we have that before you there for March 1st and 2nd uh, for your approval. And again, it is in Raleigh. Yes, sir. Now, how will, how will they be transported? Activity bus. Okay. Yes, sir. It's overnight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Need a motion to approve the overnight field trip as requested by the superintendent. Make a motion. Motion by Mr. Wagner. Is there a second? Second. Second, Mr. Blackburn. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Yet for you, the personnel report discussed tonight. Is there a motion to approve the personnel report? I think motion by uh, Jennifer. Is there a second? I'll second. Second. Uh, Dr. Blevins, any discussion? Oh, we can't uh, say that. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Here, none opposed. Motion carries. Announcements. Regular board meeting will be Monday, March the 25th here. Uh, Yep, spring break is March the 5th through March the 9th. Um, we'll, uh, let's plan on starting close session at 4.30. 4.30, if that's agreeable to the uh, check your calendar. It's a little bit earlier, but I think it'll be warranted. See if you can do that. And then the meeting will be 6 o'clock uh, for the regular meeting. Any other thing for the good of the board or the community a member would like to say? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I, yes. uh, it's more of a question. We when will we begin budget budgetary talks? Because we've heard a lot of things about numbers and so forth, and I think things have changed since last year. And so when when will we be presented with a an initial budget? Will that be next month, um, Miss? Tracy has sent out the information to the individual schools and has gathered all that information. And the cutoff was last week. She's currently compiling that. And we, as a central office, will sit down uh, very soon to start breaking that down and prioritizing. Uh, we have a scheduled date already of April 30 to at 6 p.m. to present to the county commissioners in Surrey County. Uh, so that's our you see, we've got our window there from, from tonight to April 30, but we are already building that uh, that budget. Now, when will the board be given a, a preliminary budget for us to review? Uh, that, that'll be a question for Miss Rachel. Okay. March. Yeah. Around the corner. March. Yeah. March. March 25th. Okay. Right around the corner. Right around the corner. 
to the commissioner's meeting last April 30th. April 30th. That's a, that's a good thing. We, you know the specific time, so the board members, you know, we like, that's occasionally we, we will go to the six o'clock to six o'clock. It's usually our six o'clock time six. <laughs> Is that when they will meet with all three school districts in the county? Yes. Yeah. Typically, that's how they yes. do it. Yeah, they, they all go at the same, yeah, during the same, during the same block of time. Yeah, same, same session. Yeah. They'll, They'll break us up into, yeah. just yeah. like our agenda is similar, but it'll be that same session, yes. Yeah. They do all four schools. They'll do Surrey Community College and then Surrey County and Mount Area and Elk, and they'll do it all block of time. So we are scheduled for six o'clock, or do they start with the community? I'm not sure. Work? They were specific. All they gave us was a, a letter that said be there at six o'clock on April 30. So I'm not sure. And that's in Dobson at the courthouse. Usually it's in the courthouse. Yes, the old court, the old courthouse. Yeah, the old courthouse. They're on the square in that back. Uh, yeah, it's usually in the back area. building there at the square. But just to confirm, uh, Ms. Creasy will have us a preliminary budget to look at. March, March twenty fifth. Well, she is already building it. Yes. Well, and I and I, I I feel for you in so many ways. I mean, you're just new on the job. Uh, October fifth, you knew on the job. December fifth, and so you having a you having a lot of catch up to to do. And so, I'm not meaning to put pressure, but I get calls and ask about. What about this money? What about that money? And I'm not able to answer. And so. Any other comments for the good of the community or the board? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to dismiss. Motion to dismiss. Adjourn. Second by Mr. Wagner. All in favor say aye. 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 Hearing none opposed. Motion adjourned. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>